Um, good morning and welcome to this uh, discussion about uh, the implementation of Multiclude um, in Hungary, a country where uh, policy is not really uh, driving schools towards inclusion in education. Um, I'm having a discussion with Judith Horgas, um, who was supporting us in the implementation of the Multiclude uh, scoring matrix and also subsequent trainings um, in Hungary and with Hungarian teachers. Um, Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to ask you what is your personal opinion about the usefulness of such inclusion tools for Hungarian schools and Hungarian uh, educational contexts? Well, I think it is very, very useful uh, because inclusion is a sore point in Hungarian education and in uh, Hungarian society. So uh, we should have lots and lots of programs like this. And basically, uh, we should move towards a more inclusive society. The problem is that uh, uh, there is no political will behind it. So basically, when uh, we want to start a program like this, uh, we have to, as I usually say, fly under the radar. So uh, try to trick the authorities uh, a bit and, uh, and to work with teachers uh, in a way that enables them to, to work on their own, uh, regardless of what uh, the government or politicians want to happen in Hungary. And it's really very difficult. The multitude scoring matrix touches upon seven different dimensions of uh, inclusion. And some of them are very closely related to uh, the management of schools. Um, you were talking about the political context, and we know that um, Hungary, uh, the Hungarian school system is very much centralized and there is very little autonomy given to school leaders. Um, how much uh, those areas, especially the management um, areas of the multi include metrics are relevant for a Hungarian school? Unfortunately, as, as we could see during um, uh, the conversations with the teachers and the uh, uh, head uh, teachers, uh, it is very difficult to include all the points. It's almost impossible because it's so centralized. Uh, they just cannot uh, make it happen. Uh, but what, what I uh, found really interesting is that there are great differences uh, in Hungary, between, even between the schools. Um, I, I have absolutely no idea why I think there is a there are personal reasons behind this. So some some of the areas are more restrictive. Some of them let the teachers have more freedom. So uh, what we saw is that some schools believe that they could uh, make minor or not as minor changes to be more inclusive. And some schools said that it was just impossible because the system would not support that. Uh, I have a feeling that it's uh, basically the, the differences are perhaps personal, like uh, some uh, representatives of the educational authorities uh, are more friendly towards uh, inclusion and some of them just reject it. And, uh, and this is really what determines whether the management issues uh, can be realized or not. Unfortunately, uh, as uh, we went through all the, the steps and, and the questions, very often the teachers said that it's out of their league. They just cannot do anything about that because this is so centralized that they have to accept what it is. So it's uh, partially uh, dependent on the personality and the wish of the school leader, but also uh, depends on the school district as far as yes, I that, that, yeah, that's what happening. Yes. What is interesting is that uh, the overwhelming majority of schools who uh, were willing to participate in the program are from smaller uh, settlements, small towns, villages. Um, is it because um, it is easier for people to navigate the system in big cities? Or is it just that, um, just, is it because um, teachers teaching in a village school are usually more committed to the issue because they are closer to the community who needs to be included? I think both these reasons are relevant, absolutely. And um, also, once again, there are personal reasons behind this. So the schools I work with, 
uh, are mostly uh, based on, on smaller settlements, so not, not in the capital. And uh, very often uh, I find that teachers who work in these schools are just more committed to the cause and to their jobs. Um, they have to be because they don't have so many opportunities. So if, if they want to change anything, they have to change it in their school. They, because in the capital, if a teacher is not satisfied with the work or, or with the environment, uh, he or she can just go to another school and find better, uh, um, I don't know, better uh, things or better colleagues or better environment. But in a smaller settlement, it's just impossible because they're lucky to have just that one school. So the teachers who are really committed uh, to inclusion, they try to change what they can for their own very good reasons. So if they, they want to work better, they just work on it. Yeah, and um, well, Hungary is a very peculiar country in many ways, uh, oh, but it's yes. also, yeah, uh, it is also uh, interesting to mention that uh, in Hungary, basically, uh, linguistic inclusion is not a big uh, topic. Uh, as compared to the overwhelming majority of Europe, uh, we don't really have uh, students and parents in schools who don't have Hungarian as their mother tongue or first language. Um, how can uh, still linguistic inclusion be relevant in the Hungarian quite monolingual? What, what you're saying is too that apart from bigger cities, there, are, there aren't really uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, Hungarian. Although it's a language that is really very difficult to learn and <laughs> we don't really have uh, linguistic neighbors. So um, yeah, so it's tricky, but what we do have, and it's, I think is, is almost as difficult, is that uh, we have a large majority of the Roma and uh, we have settlements where uh, the population, uh, the majority of the population are Romani and the cultural differences I think are just as significant as the language, uh, as the linguistic, uh, differences and it is very tricky because we have virtually no Romani teachers so all the teachers that work in these schools are white middle class culturally speaking that means it's almost as if they were speaking a different language so even if they are really into inclusion and if they, if they are excellent uh, teachers it is just a difference that they really have to work on and let's face it, it's, it's almost as difficult as having a, a different language, a different mother tongue. Uh, speaking of the Romani minority, um, given their um, problems um, with their socioeconomic status, with income, uh, with healthcare, um, a pro a healthcare access, um, we also know that uh, there is a much higher percentage of children with um, special education needs in the Romani population than in the majority population. The multi-include uh, approach is looking into the inclusion needs of each and every student. How much do you think um, what you've been doing with the schools could help them to look at these uh, Romani students as individual children with not just inclusion needs as Romani children, but also as disabled uh, students or students with dyslexia. So how much um, could they become better at um, individualizing their inclusion approach rather than having a Roma inclusion program? I, th I think that, that we are making the first steps with this. Uh, and uh, here I might mention that we had uh, a training for these teachers and I, I found that this was really elemental for them. It was really wonderful to see how much their uh, impressions and how much their attitude changed. Uh, because all these teachers, they are really very good professionals, but they have to understand what, what is happening. So for example, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, Romani children are diagnosed uh, to have special needs. 
what I think is really happening is that probably due to the cultural differences, these children are not really, uh, they do not really have special needs. They just need somebody to understand them in their own cultural environment. And so basically they, they are misdiagnosed. Now these teachers have absolutely no idea about this. So what they see is that they, they see children uh, that they have a lot of problems with. Uh, then they tell the parents to take these children to a psychiatrist, which is a problem because there aren't enough psychiatrists, especially uh, in the countryside, there aren't enough uh, professionals. And then they diagnose the children with uh, uh, whatever HDHD, and then they are given medicine and um, it's, it's starting a circle that makes it impossible to work with these children. So basically they are medicated and uh, that, that makes any kind of inclusion even more difficult. And to break this very big bad cycle, we have to make teachers understand that probably it's not the children who have special needs, probably it's the teachers who have special needs. So they, they have the special need to understand what is happening or what's, this, what's the uh, cultural difference that, that, that is existing between them and these children or their families. After implementing the scoring matrix and um, having a kind of snapshot on the um, inclusion situation in schools, <clears throat> um, you mentioned that um, we also worked with them um, in a training, trying to make them more aware of their own inclusion practices. And there you introduce the very important special approach that is also very special, especially for this um, major um, problem causing minority. I mean, problem causing for teachers and not um, like rascals um, group. Um, you introduced a, a trauma approach um, in the discourse that's not part of the multi-include uh, approach yet but um, you found it very important to highlight that uh, part of the special education needs uh, issue is that these children have multidimensional traumas that have to be taken into consideration. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, uh, it's, it's not only a multidimensional trauma, but uh, it goes back to several generations. So what, what we see is these children are traumatized in several ways. So basically they live in a society that is not inclusive, that is simply put racist. And, uh, and this goes back to generations. So they live in families that have experienced this for several generations. That means that the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles, they are all traumatized very severely. And that means that when they are put in this white middle-class uh, environment that the school and the teachers represent, they're just lost. And the teachers, even if they are really into inclusion and they want to be really helpful, they don't realize that there's this trauma and this makes them traumatized as well because they feel ineffective they, they feel that there is no connection. They don't know how to communicate. And the first step would be to understand that these children are just traumatized and they are showing, very often they are showing signs that you would see in a veteran soldier. I mean, like after war, it's really very dis distressing. And what we teach uh, these, ch uh, these teachers who work with these children is uh, to, to have a very different attitude and not to ask why this child is bad or nasty or I don't know, badly behaving, but to ask the question, what has happened to this child? And if they try to ask this question again and again and to go, go deeper and to see the personal history of the child and all the traumas that have happened to the child, that will help them to understand that these children do not behave badly in order to annoy them. Because very often uh, 
even parents tend to think that the children behave badly just you know to be an annoying brat but that's not the truth so when when a child behaves badly that's a kind of a shout for help a cry for help uh, this is a, the way a child can express that something is wrong and uh, and the environment is not helpful and this is what we ask teachers to think about what could have happened to these children. Yes, and, and also in the next project, probably they should also be given tools to uh, somehow tackle the trauma or just um, identify it. Yes, I, I think that in order to start on the path of healing, the first step is to acknowledge that there is trauma. But very often teachers would not even see that. Uh, and, we, and we tell them stories about what could have happened or very often what kind of stories happen to these children. And when they, when they have to face it, well, that's, they are very often shocked because of course they don't know about this. So very often terrible things can happen to a child that we have absolutely no idea about. Even if we meet that child every day, we just don't know, we're not aware because uh, you know, there, there, are, there are signs that are not as easy to notice as a, a blackened eye or, or anything else. So sometimes it's just not as easy to realize. That probably this is something that could be useful also for uh, other country contexts, because in countries where uh, they have a high number of newly arrived migrants, especially refugees from war zones, um, a lot of inclusion uh, programs are also tackling the trauma of those who are refugees, but at the same time, I don't think there is um, too much about tackling the traumas of the other uh, less included groups. And also there was a lot of discussion about the already present minorities being neglected at the price um, of um, um, prioritizing refugees and newly arrived migrants and probably a trauma informed and trauma um, a conscious approach could be uh, helpful for including other minorities too. Uh, I mean, yes. outside of the Hungarian context. Yes, it's, it's very uh, interesting to see that uh, if you have a, a migrant person, you can always blame those others, the other countries, the other authorities. But if you have a, a person uh, who is a, a part of the minority, then you really don't have anybody else to blame but yourself and your own society because they have been living with us for like hundreds of years. So how come they are still uh, fighting this, uh, these uh, inclusion problems? And it's, uh, it's difficult to, to face that, uh, that there's only ourselves to blame or only our own society and, um, I don't know, neglect that we have to blame. Yeah, well, that's very, that's very true. Well, let's hope that at least the teachers who have been actively, uh, actively involved in uh, piloting and also implementing multi-include will form a, a community of practice in Hungary. Um, it's not very easy because uh, there is a linguistic issue. It's really difficult to exchange ideas with other countries because in Hungary we have a very low level of English um, as such. But we are trying to work on uh, supporting this community, community of practice. Uh, to finish with, um, I would have a, a kind of double question. Um, one is, uh, what do you find uh, the most interesting or unique in uh, multi include? And uh, why would you recommend, as a subsequent question, why would you recommend others to have a look and also to join the community of practice that we are forming, uh, mainly in English? Yes, uh, well, basically I have the same answer to both these questions and it's the complexity of the approach. Is uh, uh, It was really very interesting to see that uh, when I started working with the, the schools and, and teachers and we were talking about inclusion as such, and of course they knew what inclusion was. So we started talking about all the different aspects and going through all, all the phases and all the questions. And uh, 
they were surprised to see how many different aspects to inclusion are because uh, they said that, okay, we have dealt with this or we have heard with about that, uh, but not this one and this one and this one. So the complexity of the whole approach was really very interesting for them. And uh, I, I had the feeling that they had, that some of the questions were so totally new that they have never even considered that this was also a, a part of inclusion and this was really something that they should look at. Like uh, very often they don't really work with the communities. It's unfortunately because it's not an inclusive society in Hungary, uh, they don't always think about working with the, the NGOs, for example, that are locally available. So the, the, there were so many sides to this uh, that they haven't considered yet. So it was very, very interesting to see how they were opening up to the new possibilities uh, again and again. And oh, well, yeah, really, this is a good idea saying this again and again, or saying that, oh, I've never thought about this, but really now, now I'm coming to think about this. Yeah, yeah, we should really look into this. And this is very often the case uh, in all the schools and with all the teachers that I work with. And I think to answer the second question, I think that's what is really uh, very good about this program is that the, they have so many new ideas and they tackle so many different problems that uh, if you consequently go through all the steps that they provide or that they have questions about, well, then basically you have it. So it's, it's, it's really a full and complex approach. And I think it's, it's really very helpful even to think about this as a first step. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your availability, also for your uh, commitment to it. And also I will pass on your uh, kind of praise to our colleagues who were uh, part of developing the matrix. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.